And so we know that the entropy in this room has to be less than or equal to the surface area of this room, which happens to be the same by arrangement uh, as the surface area of the black hole that we made. At the end, we can just forget about having made this black hole. We could have made the black hole, and so it has to be true that the entropy in this room is less than the surface area of the walls. A black hole is, is, is just like any other object. It's basically a membrane that you can probe. And if you throw something at a black hole, then what you will notice is within a very short time as it approaches the horizon, not, absolutely no signal from that object that you threw in will have any chance of getting to you anymore. It'll go completely dark. Now if you go towards the black hole and you try to see how big is this thing now, it re you will really find that it's gotten bigger. When you send some probes there and you, and you basically look at you know, how close can I get to this thing and still pull them back, still not have them cross the horizon and fall in, it really will be a bigger surface. You can calculate this, it's really true. Right? The thing that fell into the black hole has long gone, it's in the past. What you see now is simply a bigger object with no trace of the object that fell in. So those are calculations you can do, it's, it, th this is really true. There are bizarre ways of choosing coordinate systems which can sometimes make you believe something else. But, but the, any physical question that you ask, like if I go there and I look for the system, is it still there? The answer is no, you're not going to see anything there. That packing information more tightly requires more energy for them. And I think the equations we showed earlier is that actually having the information or accessing the information that requires the energy. It would seem that having large amounts of information simply sitting there and not being used would not require energy at all. That's the writing or reading that, that, that requires energy. And that would be right. Uh, so that, that's, that's not right, because having the information means that you've made some features in your fields, for example. That are very that are very sharp. That that where you make your say the electromagnetic field change over very short distances by by a lot. Okay, and to do that, you had to put in some energy in the first That's place. The so it's already the writing process. Yeah, <coughs> yeah. But simply once the writing is done, then it can sit there for an arbitrary long yeah. time and not exchange energy. If you, if you haven't exceeded your energy max, yeah, and, and made a black hole. If I take this room and I have information to start with about 10 to the 28 molecules, and which way is this one moving, and that one, and the other one, right? That's a lot of information. And in the end, you're left with three numbers. Forget the three numbers. Compared to 10 to the 28, that's nothing, right? So it's true, there's, there's a tiny little bit left, but that's not, that's, that's not enough. Even if, even if just a few numbers went missing, we'd already have a conflict with the second law. But almost all of them go missing. So a pl the Planck constant is not a length. So the relation that I wrote down is, uh, it, it tells you the relation between the energy of a feature and, and, its, and its size. Uh, so, sorry, I mean Planck length. Then the Planck, yeah. So the fact that you can't make features smaller than a Planck length is true, but it's not a strong enough statement compared to, compared to what I've been telling you. So for example, if so, so if you just try to make one feature, if you try to encode one bit of information, you could get it to be as small as about one Planck length. And if you tried smaller, you would instead be making a Planck-sized black hole, a tiny little black hole. But if you have many bits of information, then the point at which things start collapsing into a actually much bigger black hole is already at a lower density. Okay. That's because the mass of a black hole goes in proportion to its radius, not its radius cubed. So actually, larger and larger black holes have lower and lower density that you require to make them. Okay. So, so if you have a lot of information, like, like the amount of information we have in this room, um, I couldn't even pack all of that to a density of one bit per Planck length. It, it, would, it would collapse earlier. Maybe I should continue. Um, so, well, I've already told you the story, um, by doing this little thought experiment of converting this room into a black hole of the same surface area, we're learning that the initial information must have been less than the final information content, which we know how to compute, that of the black hole. So it must have been less than the surface area. And so this is the sense in which 
in which the world can be thought of as a hologram. I'm guaranteed that I can completely specify the state that this room is in, down to the smallest detail you can imagine, by writing little letters, even just ones and zeros, on the walls of this room at a density of about one per Planck area. One per such tile of length, 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. That should be enough. Okay. That should tell you all that there is to say about physics in this room. And the funny thing about this conclusion is that we assume nothing in order to get to this conclusion. We assume nothing um, about what the degrees of freedom are that are actually fundamental to nature. We didn't assume that there are quarks or strings or whatnot. We just said there can be more of them than is allowed by black hole physics. So we're learning something very deep about nature from a very simple argument. That, that, that's something quite beautiful. We're also learning something that's a little counterintuitive. You would have expected that if I, if I scale up the length of, of each of the three directions in this room, if I make it twice as wide, twice as high, twice as deep, um, that I should get eight, eight times as much information as the maximum information content. The volume is multiplied by eight. Instead, what I'm learning here is that I only get four times as much. The area grows only like the square of the characteristic length. So somehow the world isn't as local as we might have thought it was. You, know, you would think that the information in the room should, should be proportional to the volume simply because it looks like I can change a molecule, its direction over here in the room. It shouldn't, it shouldn't affect anything that goes on over there. I, I should be able to write my letters completely independently at each point in space. What we're learning here is that at some deeper level, once effects of gravity become very important, that's no longer true. The, the only reason why it seemed true to us is that we don't operate in an environment that's close to complete gravitational collapse. We're really, really, really far away from that. It seems to us obvious that the world is local for the same reason that it seemed to us obvious that, that uh, um, space-time doesn't bend before Einstein told us that it does. It's just, it's not in our, in our regime of everyday experience. But apparently it must be true if we are to make sense of quantum gravity. Now, the deeper reason to see why it's true, that's very hard to see, right? When we actually check if this is true, come up with an example, calculate how much is the information in this or that system, compare it to its surface area. You can do that calculation over and over and over again for many different systems, you always find the information that you had there is less than the surface area if you take into account gravity properly. If you make sure that you haven't packed more density into the region than is allowed by the laws of gravity, than is allowed if we don't want to collapse to a black hole. So you can check many different examples and the way that it works out is really quirky. It seems to be a bit different in each example. There's always some effect in that that combines gravity and quantum mechanics that prevents you from putting too much information there. But, so this is very similar to how we understood the equivalence between, between uh, a gravitational and inertial mass before Einstein found the theory of, of general relativity. It seemed like a coincidental thing almost. Okay. And once he found the theory that underlies it, it became obvious. What we're looking for is a theory that makes it obvious to start with that the number of degrees of freedom in nature has something to do with the area of surfaces and not with the volume. In some special instances, string theory has already succeeded in doing that in a very beautiful way. But this seems to be a pattern that goes far beyond um, the relatively simple uh, uh, space times that we can currently study in, in string theory. So it may help us to move further. Now what I've told you so far is a story where I've at least motivated this by some kind of Gedanken experiment by using the second law. But in fact the pattern that information content is related to surface areas is far, far more general than I had any right to assume based on this, on this uh, well, kind of very hand-waving argument I gave you. Okay, and that's where your question comes in. What if I actually follow something into a black hole? 
So I've cranked up the mass of this room very much, and now it's collapsing. And from the outside, it is a black hole. I can't, nothing comes out anymore. It's just this, this, this uh, uh, region of space-time hidden away from us by this one-way membrane. But what if I jump in with the room? Or in other words, I just stay in the room as it collapses. Well, now what I'm seeing is that there's a fixed amount of information, presumably. Information can't decrease which is getting squeezed more and more. Gravitational collapse looks like this. You basically get squeezed in, 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 into zero volume. It's very simple. Okay. So we have a fixed amount of, of information that's collapsing into zero volume. It now looks like this statement is simply un, obviously untrue. The surface area of, of a collapsing room, if you just look at the walls, is going to go to zero. Its entropy content can't possibly go to zero. It can't become less, less complex as it goes to smaller smaller values. That's, that's the problem that I was worried about. I was worried about whether, whether statements like this can, can make sense as, as, as apparently deep principles about quantum gravity if they look like they're simply untrue, especially in situations where gravity is extremely important, like inside a black hole. That would be a bad principle for quantum gravity if you can't make sense of it when gravity is strong. Okay. But it turns out you can make sense of it. You can, you can invent, you, well, you can invent a, a more precise statement relating area to um, area of, of space-time surfaces to adjacent space-time regions where you look at the entropy of the matter that's living there. That reduces to these statements that I've just kept giving you for, for situations where you haven't yet collapsed to a black hole. But that continues to be true deep inside a black hole. And the way that nature conspires to make to keep it true is even more bizarre and, 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 and eclectic for different examples than, than the examples you could have studied in the regime that I was talking about. So, so let, me, let, me just, yeah, let me just give you, give you the short summary. What we've learned is that this pattern is more general than what I was able to present in this talk. To describe exactly what this pattern looks like, I would have to be more technical than I want to be in a talk like this. But the basic idea is very simple. You take a surface area, any surface, it doesn't even have to be a closed one like the wall of this room, and you look at light rays that emanate orthogonally away from the surface area. Imagine the walls of this room were lined with little laser guns, and they send light rays towards the, the center. And you look at what all these light rays see before they intersect. And that's what you count as the information content that you're going to compare to the initial area. Okay. Now, if, if we're just all sitting peacefully in this room with no gravitational collapse, that's still that's exactly the same statement that I was making all along. The light rays simply see what's in the room, and that's what you count. Okay. But if the room is headed towards a singularity deep inside the black hole, for collapsing very rapidly, what actually happens is that the light rays that emanate from the surface area, which might now be very much smaller already because the room has collapsed, might be dangerously small, smaller than the total information content of the room. Those light rays don't have enough time left anymore to get towards all the way towards the center of the room before space and time and everything ends in this horrible singularity deep inside the black hole. Those light rays are just going to barely be able to scratch the surface of the room and then boom, everything is over. Okay. This is something you can calculate, you don't have to believe me. And there are many other examples like that. If you just work it out explicitly, somehow the light rays, if you work with light rays relating information to, to areas, then, then you really have a completely general pattern that you can't understand just from the point of view of, of black holes, little, little thought experiments like this. It's a very overarching, mysterious pattern that I don't think we, we have even scratched the surface off in terms of understanding this from a deeper point of view. And, and I think once we have a proper quantum theory of gravity, uh, it's going to make this pattern seem completely obvious. Well, until then, it'll, it'll remain quite mysterious. Thank you.